Texas Civil Society Policy Forum. We are grateful to be invited here for this panel, Applying Fundamental Labor Rights in the Global Cotton Supply Chains. ILRF is, I'm the Executive Director of the International Labor Rights Forum, and I'm very honored to be able to introduce this panel. We have kind of a fun international panel here. One PhD and three lawyers, and our, actually four lawyers with our moderator. Lawyers who are educated in Australia, Russia, Russia, and the US. Very well. Can we work on this mic? Do I need to lean in? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, lean okay. In. I'm <laughs> 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 Okay, so I'll start over. I'm Judy Gearhart. I'm the Interna uh, International Labor Rights Forum Executive Director. I'm really honored to introduce this panel. We are grateful to the Civil Society Forum for hosting this panel, for letting us come and talk about the issue of forced labor in Uzbekistan here at the bank. We've been working on the role of the World Bank in Uzbekistan for quite some years, and we're happy to be able to be heard in this venue. We're at a critical juncture in Uzbekistan right now, not only because this is the harvest season and we're already finding forced labor in this harvest season, but also because President Karimov's passing away recently means there are some opportunities opening up for change in Uzbekistan. Also, 2015 was one of the most oppressive years for our frontline human rights defenders. The Cotton Campaign and ILRF works very closely with those people who are on the ground documenting forced labor in the Uzbek cotton harvest, and there were several cases of serious um, beatings, searches, house verdict being burned down, people being detained, it got worse, even though we got the ILO in on the ground, our, our human rights defenders suffered more. So we're really at a critical juncture, and I cannot understate enough the problematic influence of the World Bank's continued investment, despite reports from the ILO, as well as our human rights defenders, that there is still forced labor happening in Uzbekistan. So I very much hope this panel can try and address the role of the World Bank and how we can move forward in a way that is more conducive to stopping this, this problem with forced labor in Uzbekistan's cotton sector. So the bios for the panelists are being circulated around. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I do want to just give you a sense of how the panel is going to run and then turn it over to our moderator. Andy Shen is the, the senior staff attorney from the International Labor Rights Forum, and he will kick off our discussion with an analysis of the legal obligations of the World Bank and others to uphold and avoid complicity in violations of international human rights norms. Andy's an international labor rights law specialist. He's worked on ILRF seafood and cotton campaigns, and he's the author of ILRF's recent report, which we're very proud of, called Financing Forced Labor, the Legal and Policy Implications of World Bank Loans to the Government of Uzbekistan. Following Andy, we'll have Allison Gill, who will focus on recent reports from the 2016 cotton harvest in Uzbekistan. Allison's extensive experience researching and conducting advocacy on human rights issues in Europe and Central Asia. She's working with the Uzbek German Forum on Human Rights, and which is one of the core partners of the cotton campaign. Following Allison, we'll have Jessica Evans, senior researcher and advocate working on International Financial Institutions for Human Rights Watch. Jessica's going to talk about the World Bank's response to forced labor in its project areas in Uzbekistan, and she's going to propose some recommendations for a way forward. Finally, we have Mike Hogan, who brings a whole new, exciting set of information to this work. Um, he, Mike Hogan is the Vice President of Life Sciences at, the, at Applied DNA Sciences, and he's going to talk about DNA technology in the global cotton supply chains. We're very excited to have Mike here. It's, it's got to be what we consider breakthrough technology for advancing traceability, and um, we saw some global brands that had RSVP to attend this event, and we've worked a lot in the past through the cotton campaign to work with brands to enable them to know when they have Uzbek cotton in their supply chain or Turkmen cotton or any other cotton made with forced labor. And I think what Mike brings to the table is the possibility to really pin that down. So with this summary of what we're gonna try and achieve today, I wanna to turn this over and introduce uh, the new cotton campaign coordinator. 
The Cotton Campaign is a great coalition that's been running for nearly 10 years now. It's housed at ILRF. It includes um, investors and human rights organizations and trade unions, as well as some global brands that have been supporting some of the activities. We have been engaging heavily with the ILO and the World Bank in trying to solve this problem and trying to make sure that their interventions on the ground are really leading to change. So Kenita Wojcicki, who rounds out our team of international lawyers up here, um, I'm going to turn it over to him. He has extensive experience working on forced labor and trafficking, having worked for years for the International Organization of Migration and several other institutions. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judy, for the introduction. I will say my name again, uh, just because it's not an easy name. Uh, it's like a tongue twister, really. Um, Kirill Boychenko. Uh, here it is. It can be it can be difficult at times, but however, this is this is very exciting to have a panel here at the World Bank. Uh, what is the best time than now? What is the best place than than here? And Today we'll be talking about some of the important aspects in uh, cotton supply chain, and I would really like to uh, to come up with some of the solutions because we have companies from one side, we have the World Bank, both the World Bank Group, we have uh, international organizations, and they all can contribute to changing the situation to the better. And right now, it's the time to change the situation. So we'll be talking about the way forward, some of the solutions, and uh, what what can be what can be changed and what can be done. Uh, the order of business is that all of our panelists will, will have ten minutes each, and then five minutes for a follow-up or any clarifying questions. But we'll also leave some room for a Q&A session at the end, and hopefully for some reflections and conclusions. And with that, I would like to pass this floor, Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carrillo and Judy, for your um, introductory remarks. Um, thank you all for attending this session. Um, very glad to be here today to speak on the issue of um, World Bank involvement in uh, Uzbekistan and um, potential um, liability and legal implications of um, financial complicity in forced labor in Uzbekistan. So I will begin um, my presentation by discussing bri very briefly some of the key actors that are involved in the human rights violations that are ongoing in Uzbekistan. Um, and then I will go into the international legal obligations of the World Bank and the legal implications of its decision to continue financing Uzbekistan's con production and then conclude with some recommendations to the bank. So the Uzbek government is the principal perpetrator of systematic forced labor in Uzbekistan. However, global brands and the World Bank Group have also contributed to the longevity of the forced labor system in Uzbekistan. The World Bank Group, including the IBRD, the IPA, and the IFC, have provided agricultural loans to the government of Uzbekistan and private companies sourcing Uzbek cotton since 1995. As far as the Uzbek government and global brands, um, I'll leave it to my colleagues, Allison um, and Jessica, to speak on that. But I will go ahead and dive into uh, international legal obligations of the World Bank. Uh, I think it's important to start with that to get an understanding of the legal framework in which international organizations such as the World Bank operate. So companies have legal obligations just as governments do, and international organizations which are formed by governments such as the United Nations and the World Bank also have international legal obligations. And this includes um, treaty obligations and also applicable customary international law. And most importantly, you know, the focus of my report is on use Kogan obligations. So for some of you who have studied international law, you're probably well aware that use Kogan's norms are the highest ranking norms in international law. And it's important because these norms protect fundamental values. And as, as a result, 
use cogent norms, also known as peremptory norms, are non-variable, which means that there are no exceptions in which they may be modified or violated, except potentially by another use cogent norm. So there are very few use cogent norms in an international system. Some that have been identified um, quite often are the prohibition of slavery, prohibition of genocide, prohibition of torture, and prohibition of racial discrimination and apartheid. And I make the argument in my report through in-depth analysis based on standards that are being developed by the UN that ILO Convention 105 Article 1B, which is the violation that the government um, is committing, is systemat in systematically mobilizing and using forced labor for economic purposes is in fact a use code norm. And as a result, of its status as a use code norm, there are legal effects. Um, first and foremost, any kind of international agreement that conflicts with the use code slogan norm should be void and terminated. Um, and second of all, it's important to note that you know, these kind of norms protect the values of the international community, of civil society, of citizens around the world, and are held up by the international legal community as norms that must be given them utmost respect and be protected. So the World Bank, um, as some of you know, has had a complicated relationship with human rights. Um, in its constitutive instrument, Articles of Agreement, there are certain provisions that says it can only consider economic factors in making its own decisions. Um, that said, the World Bank has never disputed that it has an obligation to adhere to use covenant norms in its operations. So from that point, we can go and say that you know, it is in fact an exception to the Articles of Agreement that um, the general rule that the World Bank can only consider economic factors, and in fact, uh, use covenant norms are, are an exception to that general rule. And this is, of course, consistent with state practice of Practices for international organizations and the concept of peremptory norms is well established in international law. So I'll go a bit into detail about um, the analysis of ILO Convention 105, Article 1B. Um, excuse me if I get too much into the details in the weeds. Um, as a lawyer, I find this very fascinating. As a, a lawyer focused on international labor rights, um, I find this convention and this article in particular. Um, very important to our society and to the world. Um, so we'll dig in a little bit and, and just kind of examine that particular norm and, and how it's being violated by the Uzbek government and also how the World Bank uh, is involved in the violation of this norm. So forced labor as defined by the ILO is all work or service extracted from any person under the menace of pen penalty um, for which this person has not offered himself voluntarily basically involuntary work or service um, under the menace of penalty. The UN International Law Commission, which is the branch of the UN responsible for developing and codifying international law, um, started examining use Kogan's norms last year. And over the next few years, it will identify just how to, to determine whether a norm has attained the status of use Kogan's it will explain the legal effects of violating use Kogan's, and it will also potentially identify some norms that it considers has attained use Kogan status. So some of the criteria that it has put forward include the nature of the norm. This means that the norm has to be universally applicable and non-derogable, which means no exceptions. The norm has to protect the fundamental values of the international community, which include basic considerations of humanity, ensuring peaceful coexistence among member states of the international community. And also, um, use Kogan's norms may relate to economic and social order, and they may be linked to principles of equality, dignity, and autonomy. Now, I think it's important to, to focus now on um, just how important this norm is in protecting and ensuring uh, peaceful coexistence among the international community. So freedom of labor and the right of workers to be free from coercion has um, many different effects as far as economic development, socioeconomic development in the world. 
Um, with globalization and the interconnectedness of markets, we're seeing that forced labor in one country, for example, Uzbekistan, can have wide-ranging effects and through the supply chain, reach the US, the EU, and other markets. When you have forced labor produced goods enter the US, for example, there has, there's many implications to this, including unfair competition, um, suppression of wages of American workers, um, among other things. Going to uh, the principles of equality, dignity, and autonomy, it's important to note that the prohibition of forced labor for economic purposes and the drive to put that in the international convention had the same moral motivation as the prohibition of slavery. So it's, it's founded on the idea that all humans are born equal with the right to freedom from oppression. Um, so it's important to note that as you know, the idea of freedom of labor is really a fundamental value of, of the international community. Other criteria um, that I examine in the report include state practice. Um, this convention is the second most ratified convention of all UN and ILO conventions. It has more ratifications than the conventions against genocide and torture. There are only very, very few examples of states that are still violating this norm, including North Korea, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. And it's also important to note that there are, have been several statements by the ILO and by the UN condemning this form of forced labor. Uh, the UN Human Rights Office has noted that this form of forced labor is a utopian norm. The ILO has made several statements that forced labor in general is a utopian norm. So I, I think it's you know, well established through these criteria that this particular norm has reached that very high status and deserves that kind of respect. So now transitioning into uh, some of the legal implications of the World Bank's decision to continue providing agricultural loans to the Uzbek government. Um, the focus of my report is on a 2013 complaint that the Khan Campaign uh, Coalition filed to the inspection panel alleging uh, violations of forced labor at World Bank project sites. This 2013 com uh, complaint was considered by the inspection panel but ultimately, the inspection panel decided to recommend against suspending loans to the state government, despite acknowledging that there's a plausible link between its loans and forced labor. And in the three years since that complaint, as my colleagues will, will show, there have been many, many reported ongoing violations um, of this norm. Um, Last year alone, in 2015, um, Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights and its monitors in Uzbekistan estimated over one million victims of forced labor in the cotton harvest. The ILO also had its third party monitoring mission and many of its conclusions were consistent with Uzbek German Forum monitors' conclusions. It's also important to note that the US State Department has ranked Uzbekistan on tier three its annual trafficking and prisons report. The UN Human Rights Council has made statements and reports condemning forced labor in Uzbekistan. So it's an issue that's very much on the radar of a lot of international organizations and governments. As far as legal implications, it's, it's um, important to note that in, in, in Uzbekistan, World Bank finance projects cover 10 of the 13 provinces in the country. All right, so that's majority, vast majority of provinces in the country. And under international law, the concept of climate of fear, if established, means that every victim of forced labor is under law, uh, every uh, alleged uh, victim of forced labor is under law, in fact, a, a victim of forced labor. Um, the fact that you know the World Bank projects cover 10 of the 13 provinces and we have this legal concept of climate fear means that it's highly likely that forced labor violations are occurring at World Bank project sites. Well, 
when we look at um, whether the World Bank is violating international law, um, what we're talking about primarily is the responsibility of international organizations for financial complicity <coughs> in international crimes. So there are three elements uh, to, to examine when you're discussing potential responsibility of the World Bank. Right? The first is whether the bank has provided practical aid or assistance that has a significant effect. And this is proven through its tailored loans, agricultural loans that are used by the Uzbek government for cost reduction. A very second important element is the bank's subjective knowledge of the circumstances around these alleged violations. So subjective knowledge is a question for the courts to decide, but it can be implied from surrounding facts and circumstances, including internal deliberations to the board of directors around loans, and also by objective circumstances, including reports from human rights organizations and international organizations that forced labor is occurring potentially at World Bank sites. And the third element is um, a close relationship between the organization and the principal perpetrator or the victim. So I realize I'm taking a lot of time talking about the law. I don't want to um, dig in too deep. Um, if you're interested, uh, I welcome you to read the report I wrote um, and re that was published by IL ILRF recently. Um, a lot of analysis in there, and I think many of you might find that interesting. Um, it goes into, as well, potential liability of the World Bank in U.S. courts uh, specifically in D.C. courts under the Alien Tort Statute and third-party beneficiary rights under U.S. contract law. So I, I will conclude and uh, save some time for my colleagues to present um, just by sharing some recommendations uh, to the World Bank based on uh, the examination of the issues in my report and kind of some of the, the failures of the inspection panel um, as demonstrated by its uh, engagement with civil society around the 2013 complaint. So the first recommendation is um, to the inspection panel to allow it to initiate its own investigations into alleged violations at World, World Bank project sites. Currently, the inspection panel is only prompted to investigate when it receives and registers a request for inspection by civil society organizations. Um, I think that is probably not the most productive approach. Um, it would be much more helpful to be proactive um, and to initiate investigations on its own when it's receiving credible reports of alleged violations. Another problem that, that was identified in the 2013 complaint process is that the recommendations of the inspection panel are not binding on the World Bank. So they can be accepted or they can be dismissed. Um, this is, of course, problematic when some of the recommendations, um, as reflected in other World Bank projects, World Bank, World Bank projects um, have been declined by the, by the World Bank handshake. Another problem is that um, the World Bank inspection panel um, is really the final arbiter of um, these alleged violations. Um, it might be productive to consider whether um, complainants can appeal to a higher level, perhaps an adjudicated body, for uh, an independent adjudicated body to determine whether, in fact, um, these harms have been contributed by the World Bank. Um, it's very interesting that uh, next year the UN will be considering a convention on responsibility of international organizations for violating international law. Um, I think this is an excellent opportunity for the World Bank to be involved and supportive in that process, um, to push for higher standards for international financial institutions, and to respect the rule of law in all of its operations. Two additional rec uh, recommendations include adopting a new resolution that clearly states that action plans and policy commitments of bank management and borrowing countries are not acceptable reasons for the bank the inspection panel to recommend against suspension of loans. So, you know, with this 2013 complaint, you can clearly see that the bank was satisfied by policy commitments by, by Uzbekistan and by action plans 
even though there was clear evidence that ongoing violations were occurring. And because of these policy commitments, it, it's um, raised that as justification for not suspending its loans. And finally, I think it would be very uh, productive to consider um, requiring an interim suspension of loans when the panel, inspection panel finds a plausible link between bank funds and harms alleged by complaints. So in the 2013 complaint, even though there was a plausible link identified, the bank declined to suspend its loans um, and to this, to this date it has still not suspended its loans for that project. So I, I think I'll go ahead and pass um, the microphone uh, to Allison and let her continue. Thank you very much for your time. Harvest, 
Uh, as I said, is in full swing now. It starts generally in early September and goes through the end of October or the beginning of November. And there is another period um, of forced labor in cotton production, and that is the spring planting and weeding season, um, which usually begins in late April and goes through June. And this is when um, fields are being prepared for planting. People are mobilized to plant cotton and then weed the fields. Um, just a, a few words on child labor. Um, before 2012, the government relied on widespread, systematic, mass child labor in cotton production. Um, used, they mobilized um, school children every autumn to harvest cotton. After many, many years of consistent um, international pressure from many different um, actors, the government took significant steps to curtail the use of child labor, beginning with the ending of the, uh, stopping the use of school children on a systematic level, and then stopping the use of college students who are younger than 18. In Uzbekistan, college is essentially the equivalent of a high school in the United States, so it's, um, off, it's usually kids 16, 17, and 18 years old. Um, and so in the past few years, we've not seen systematic child labor, although we continue to see sporadic cases of child labor. Um, the government in, it essentially shifted the labor burden to the adult population, particularly public sector workers, teachers, healthcare workers, um, public administration officials, um, people who work for government um, industry and enterprise. Um, but again, we do see um, continuing sporadic cases of child labor because the government has not taken enough steps to prevent the use of uh, child labor and the intense pressure on some institutions and officials to fulfill cotton harvesting and cotton production quotas means that in some cases, those officials resort to the use of child labor if they feel they must fulfill the quota or face a different <coughs> Um, but we are seeing some interesting and troubling things regarding child labor now, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, so the government um, assigns mandatory cotton production quotas to farmers. Um, they do this under threat, um, and they control every aspect of the financial system used to produce cotton, including the inputs required to grow cotton. Farmers have to sell the cotton they produce to the government at a government set price. The government sets the price um, that it purchases cotton from farmers at lower than its own estimated cost of production. So the, the government acknowledges essentially that it costs more to produce cotton than they are willing to pay for it. Um, and this is a system that keeps farmers in a chronic debt cycle. Farmers who don't meet their cotton production quotas face penalties and reprisals including loss of their land, repossession of their farm, and personal property. In 2015, um, we saw a significant um, increase in the punitive measures against farmers when the prime minister, who is now the acting president of Uzbekistan, implemented a program he called the Cleaver Program, um, by which bailiffs um, and, and police officers went around to farmers' homes to repossess cars, refrigerators, televisions, livestock um, of farmers who were in debt or who had failed to meet their production quotas. Um, annually, the government, we estimate, forces some one million people to harvest cotton, to plant, weed, and pick cotton. Um, as, I, as I noted, this has, in recent years, um, been mainly public sector employees, education and health workers, students over 18, people receiving welfare or child benefits payments, um, employees of enterprises, and these um, people are faced with consequences for refusal to pick cotton or refusal to pick enough or failure to pick enough cotton. Consequences including loss of their job, expulsion from their academic institution. The only way to get out of picking cotton is to pay a replacement worker to pick cotton in your name. So Jessica, I think, is going to talk more extensively about um, the bank's investments in Uzbekistan. I just want to note one project in particular. The um, South Karakalpakstan um, irrigation project, 
The bank has invested $337 million to modernize irrigation, mainly for farms in the South Karakalpak zone. Um, and a significant portion of the farms um, will produce cotton, or required to produce cotton. And the government, though, as the bank has um, committed to suspending the loans if it finds credible evidence of forced labor in the project area. So this is a, a really significant um, tool that the bank has to help end the use of forced labor in the project. This is a really terrible map of the project area. Um, but it does show you three districts in southern Karakalpaks and the, the southern part of the districts, the Elikula, Elikala, Turku, and Beranui districts. Um, you can sort of, not really on this map, but you can see the irrigation lines there. Um, these are the districts where we have research in 2015 and 2016, and I'll share with you more. Um, so in fall 2015 and in the spring weeding season in 2016, we documented evidence of coercion uh, forced labor and in some cases child forced child labor in in the bank project areas in South Karakalpak zone. Uh, we found that farmers were forced to meet quotas for cotton production. We found cases of children and parents forced to weed fields and harvest cotton under threat of losing their child um, welfare benefits or other welfare benefits payments. Uh, we found college students, including in some cases students who are not 18, but children. Um, school teachers, college teachers, healthcare workers, other public sector employees, and private sector employees were forced to work in the field under threat of um, expulsion, dismissal, um, and sometimes in the cases of people in the private sector, they were forced to make a, a contribution of, of the labor of their employees or a financial contribution to the harvest or they were threatened with closure of their business, burdensome tax inspections, uh, and other consequences. We also found that some colleges were assigned responsibility for cotton production on entire farms or tracts of land, um, which meant that, that academic institutions were actually forced to fulfill a cotton production quota. They were assigned a specific piece of land, um, and the teachers and the students at the college were actually farming. Um, and faced serious consequences for failure to meet their quotas. And in some cases, it led those colleges to mobilize students that were not 18 to work on the field. So it's, it's one of the way, one of the places where we see a pressure um, on officials to use child labor. And again, um, as in other parts of the country, people could only avoid picking cotton or working in the cotton fields if they paid a replacement worker, someone else, to, to work in their own land. Briefly, I, I will just note that the findings in South Karakal, Pakistan were very much in line with what we saw in the other regions that we monitored. I'm happy to answer questions and we can discuss in greater detail what the, the picture looks like I mean, in the rest of the country, but it's a very consistent picture. The system um, functions consistently across the areas that we monitored. Um, and I'm focusing on Karakal, Pakistan today because of this particular investment there. Um, so, the, the harvest is underway now. It's too early to say um, concretely what all of the evidence is or will look like. Our monitor there just completed um, an initial round of research, so I'm happy to share some preliminary findings as long as we all accept that these are very preliminary. Um, um, but we are seeing, um, again, coercion, uh, forced labor, and forced child labor in, in these regions, in these districts in 2016. Um, the mass mobilization of labor to the harvest began on September 4th and 5th. Um, the, we found that teachers are being sent to the fields in large numbers. In the schools um, that our monitor visited, uh, we found that approximately half the teachers, so 50% of the teaching staff and other education workers, were in the fields for 25-day shifts and then would be replaced by the second half of teachers, so on a rotation. Um, in some rural schools, the situation was worse. 
uh, in one school, for example, in the Turkpul region, when the monitor visited, there were only six teachers present at school for seven grades of, two, of students, um, 245 students in the school, six teachers were present, everyone else was in the field. Um, approximately 15 to 17 teachers had been sent to the fields for an extended overnight shift where they were picking cotton far from their homes and living at the field, and the other eight to 10 teachers were picking cotton in nearby fields. Um, the situation is similar for college teachers, where approximately half of the staff at a time is in the fields. Um, and third year students have been widely mobilized to pick cotton. These are students that are generally 18 years old. Um, one um, small difference this year that from last year is that the students we're seeing, um, the college students, tend to be picking at fields close to their homes instead of being um, bused to fields farther away where they're living. And again, we're seeing people who receive or depend upon child benefits or other welfare benefits um, in the fields picking cotton. So very troubling um, this year is that we are seeing um, child labor in South Karakal, Pakistan. Um, first and second year colleges, the students at colleges that we visited this year um, in all three districts were picking cotton on the weekends. These are students who are usually 16 and 17. Um, we observed eighth and ninth grade students from at least five rural schools and um, um, some schools in larger towns as well picking cotton. In some of these cases, people told us that the children had gone to school for a couple of lessons in the morning and then picked every day in the afternoons. Um, in one school in Turkpul, we saw children ages 12 to 16 picking cotton. And we've also seen very young children ages seven to 10 in the field. Um, and with, we have photos as well, with um, actually cotton picking bags on them, working in the fields alongside their parents. In some of the interviews, we were told that the parents were forced by their neighborhood council or their mahala committee to pick cotton uh, under threat of losing their child benefits, and the parents had no one to leave the children with them and pick them with them. Um, I'm gonna just very quickly tell you but Judy alluded to a really important um, feature when, in her introduction, and that is the, the efforts by the government to suppress independent information about the harvest. Um, I won't talk in detail now, but we, this last year was a year of very serious um, reprisals against independent monitor, monitors, including our monitors. And we've also seen the government make efforts to make labor appear voluntary when it is in fact involuntary. This includes instructing people to lie to monitors, um, to tell monitors that they are um, cleaning ladies instead of doctors, um, to tell monitors that they're there to earn money. Um, this photo actually shows a boy um, around 10 years old who was crouching in the fields because as the monitor approached, the teacher called out to the children to hide. Um, so this is just a, a little indication, I think, of what the stakes are where you have a forced labor system that is continuing, but a really serious effort to make that labor appear voluntary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. We do realize that we're very close. One speaker to another will read questions for the Q&A session at the end. Please remember your questions. We'll, we will take them for that session. And now the floor is yours. Jessica, our great colleague. Thank you. Hi, Marianne. I, I echo the thanks of my of my colleagues. Uh, now, to, to to get started, I want to acknowledge that the World Bank has improved its approach to forced and child labour in in Uzbekistan in the last few years. It hasn't gone anywhere near far enough, but just to give you a sense. Prior to the filing of the inspection panel complaint back in 2013, the World Bank didn't even recognize that there was a risk of child and forced labor within its agriculture projects in Uzbekistan. And in fact, rather than recognizing it as a risk and, and, uh, and undertaking due diligence to determine how it can avoid this risk, it highlighted that the risk was that civil society organizations like ourselves 
would complain uh, about child labour within the within the project areas or linked to the project. Yeah. So we, we have come quite some way since then, I'm, I'm pleased to say, uh, but we have a really, really long way to go. Uh, as, as Andy mentioned, the inspection panel in its uh, eligibility report did find that there was a risk that the World Bank project, which was an agriculture project, was contributing to the perpetuation of child and forced labour in Uzbekistan. Unfortunately, though, the inspection panel decided that it was not going to investigate how the World Bank had, whether the World Bank had violated its own policies in, in this particular project, which was an incredibly disappointing decision for, for civil society and for the people who were subject to forced and child labour who, despite the great risks to themselves, had brought this complaint to the inspection panel. And the reason that the inspection panel didn't, uh, didn't investigate is because they believe that the uh, action plan, the, the promises from the World Bank to now undertake due diligence to identify and address, address the risks of labour abuses linked to the projects uh, was, was pretty good and that they were unlikely to get a, a better, better commitments from the World Bank if they did go forward with an investigation. Uh, what we've seen since that, invest, since that inspection panel complaint is actually a, a dramatic increase in the World Bank's investments in agriculture projects in Uzbekistan. Uh, we've now, at the moment, more than uh, $500 million in agriculture investments in Uzbekistan. In addition, there are a number of other projects that I'll, I'll touch on which are indirectly linked to child and forced labour. So the, the World Bank has now uh, implemented these mitigation measures to address these risks. One of them, which Alison has touched on, is that the bank uh, sought an agreement from the government of Uzbekistan that they would enforce their own, their own laws on child and forced labour within the project area in the South Karakal Pakistan Irrigation Project. Uh, we've at the time, the World Bank also promised that there would be independent monitoring of all of the agriculture projects within Uzbekistan, as well as uh, other projects, including uh, education projects. And that there would be a grievance redress mechanism, so as people who are subject to forced and child labour would be able to bring complaints and, and actually seek redress. As you would imagine, these uh, mitigation measures would be really challenging to implement in any context but even more so within a context like Uzbekistan. Uh, unfortunately, the World Bank wasn't able to negotiate successfully with the government for independent monitors to, to, to do the work, and instead they collaborated with the, with the ILO. The ILO has an incredibly important role to play in Uzbekistan and, and elsewhere in the world in addressing labour abuses. Uh, but as many of you probably understand quite well, it has a tripartite structure, which is, which is a great thing for what its role actually is. Uh, by that, it is composed of governments, uh, labour organisations and employer organisations, as it, as it should be. But within a context like Uzbekistan, that, that is not the right body to undertake independent monitoring of World Bank projects in order to identify forced and, and child labour. It means that together with an ILO uh, representative, we have government and we have government representatives undertaking the, uh, the monitoring, but also we have the, the independent elements of it, the, the labor unions, are not unfortunately truly independent within Uzbekistan, but are actually very closely aligned with the government. To make matters worse, some of the unions that are, that are affiliated uh, with, this, with this Uzbekistan affiliation are actually involved in the mobilization of particularly teachers. Um, throughout the harvest. So we don't, um, we, we don't have the, the kind of independent monitoring that we had hoped for. And as far as the grievance redress mechanism goes, it was watered down to be a feedback mechanism and now only exists in the, in the government and in this same, uh, this same labor uh, confederation. We continue to have the ILO uh, complaints mechanisms but civil society and, indivi and plain individuals cannot bring complaints there. You need to bring them through either an employment or, or a labor, employer or labor um, organization. So 
So these mitigation measures, uh, while while more than we've seen in the past in Uzbekistan and actually in a number of other uh, challenging environments in which the World Bank works, didn't begin to address the systemic nature of forced and child labor within Uzbekistan. And nor did they address the, the repressive environment of Uzbekistan. Together with our colleagues here, we pushed very hard for the World Bank to negotiate with the government of Uzbekistan for there to be a, for the government to undertake to, provide unfettered access for independent journalists and independent NGOs at two World Bank project areas in order for them to be able to monitor for child and forced labor, and for the government to, to undertake not to retaliate against people who are doing this kind of monitoring. Unfortunately, the World Bank didn't, didn't want to go in that direction, and what we've seen is, uh, as my colleagues have described, really nasty kinds of retaliations against uh, independent monitors. And the World Bank is concerned about this. They've told us time and time again that, that they are as concerned about this retaliation as we are, and that they're having conversations with the government. These conversations are taking place behind closed doors, and we see no discernible impact of them at this point in time. The, <coughs> through the 2015 harvest, as Alison has outlined, the Uzbek German Forum, uh, at great risk, continued to do their monitoring, and. Uh, and showed that forced and unfortunately child labor continues throughout the country and, and the very systemic nature of this. The Uzbek German Forum have brought these findings to the World Bank on a whole number of occasions. And uh, the World Bank has decided that it, there isn't sufficient evidence for their, their, of um, child and forced labor linked to actual World Bank projects. And for that reason, the projects won't be in response now, we have disaggregated the, the data to be able to show that actually this, this child and forced labor is taking place in this one particular uh, World Bank project area. The reason that we focused on this project area is because, as you could see from the, the map, we have a project area for this one. We don't have that kind of uh, transparency for the, other, for the other World Bank projects. Uh, and now it remains to be seen how, how the World Bank will respond to, to this research. In, after seeing the ongoing uh, child and forced labor in 2015, the World Bank then decided through its private sector lending arm to invest in a uh, leading cotton producer within the country in Durama through a, a $40 million loan to expand a textile plant. Now this company in Durama has we have attempted to correspond with them on a number of occasions to raise concerns about child and forced labor within their supply chain. Uh, and we've received uh, very limited responses. Essentially, they say, we do not uh, tolerate uh, child and forced labor, and nor do we have conversations with independent groups like your own about, about our processes and our due diligence. We met with the IFC to discuss their, the due diligence in this case, because the IFC have said on a number of occasions that they believe that the, that the approach here is, is robust, a, a robust risk identification and mitigation scheme, which is not transparent. Uh, this, what they've said is that they've used the ILO data and the Uzbek German Forum's data to identify each district as low, medium, or high risk of labor abuses and that Indorama is only sourcing its cotton from gins that are low, uh, low risk. And it happens that Indorama has only ever sourced from low risk areas, so there's no need for them to adjust where they're currently sourcing from. But they're not willing to disclose what are these low risk districts in which Indorama is sourcing cotton from. A apart from the fact that we don't believe that there are low risk areas, this is, this is a system wide problem. Uh, the, at the same time, in defending their decision not to be transparent about where they are actually sourcing the cotton from, the ISC have suggested to us that this is a commercial secret. Uh, we weren't able to get to the bottom of why it is a commercial secret, but, but that is one of the responses that we received. So in addition to these agriculture projects, the World Bank is also significantly invested in, uh, in education within the country which is incredibly important. Uh, but 
as Alison has described, education is, is quite questionable within the country when we have uh, so many teachers being removed from uh, during the harvest and, and also during the, the springtime. To mention briefly that the IFC is also funding, I'm sure many of you who've been attending other sessions uh, this week have been hearing about the IFC's investments in financial intermediaries, and one example of that is in commercial banks. The, the IFC has also invested in a commercial bank in Uzbekistan, uh, Hancor Bank, where we are concerned not only about em employees within that bank being forced to work, which we've seen in a number of other banks, uh, but also they play a, a complicit role in, in the kinds of abuses against farmers, which uh, Alison described. So the way forward for the World Bank. First of all, we believe that because there is this ongoing link between World Bank financing and child and forced labour, and actual child and forced labour within the project areas, that it is necessary for the World Bank to live up to its own commitments and to suspend disbursements for the irrigation and the agriculture projects that are ongoing within the country. And they need to do that until the government fulfills its commitments not to utilise child and forced labour linked to World Bank projects. Then, prior to dispersing new the, this money, the World Bank needs to require the government to undertake uh, several measures. First and foremost, to instruct all government officials and citizens that are working on behalf of the government uh, not to use coercion to mobilise uh, to mobilise people to work within the cotton harvest. And they need to enforce this in a way that complies with international standards. That means uh, initiating judicial processes, uh, but ensuring that they are going against, that, that these processes are brought against senior uh, government officials who are uh, responsible for the forced labour system. Secondly, we need to allow journalists, independent journalists and independent organisations to document and report on concerns about forced and child labour without these risks of reprisal. <coughs> and finally, the government needs to undertake to initiate a time-bound plan to address the underlying causes of, of forced and child labour within the country. One element of this is increasing the transparency of, of funding, uh, of the finances around the cotton sector. So what, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that the, the profits from the cotton sector go into a fund which is not transparent and which is as accessible only by senior government officials within the country. This is one of the driving forces, sorry about the, the use of words there, one of the driving reasons for, for the forced labour system, to keep, them, to keep the costs as low as possible so as these high level government officials can continue to profit as much as possible. I'm going to stop there because time is short, but welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. We will turn to Mike Hogan. And I also want to point out that I'm here with Janice Moraglia, who is our Vice President of Governmental Affairs at Applied DNA. <clears throat> at the risk of boring you too much, what I want to do is give you, give you a brief overview of some tools that I believe secure There's tools that have been developed. We originally developed these to try to help control the international cotton supply chain, not so much to engage in things related to um, labor violations really to make sure that cotton was well identified and could be tracked and, and essentially people were paying what they were uh, getting what they were paying for but we've recently found out that there's a dark side to this as well which is that in fact some of the lower cost cottons which have been blended into the supply chain are coming from places such as Uzbekistan. The thing that makes this interesting and, 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 and 
doable is the following. Um, first of all, that is, cotton, in the genetic sense, is relatively simple in internationally. In the U.S. and uh, particularly, the cottons are relatively simple in the sense that the, the higher quality Pima cottons comprise really only a couple of seed types. And the somewhat lower quality upland cottons are really a small number. So in fact, from a pure DNA or genetic perspective, you know, what we grow in the United States, which is a substantial fraction of the world cotton trade, is relatively simple. Outside the U.S., though, it's less well regulated. Places like Egypt and Uzbekistan, there are historically local types of cotton, which have grown to be quite different from the U.S. ones. But um, uh, so the, the goal is to, in, in, in part, to try to distinguish the higher quality from the lower quality cottons based on the DNA in them. The reason you can do this, and I'll go through this in a bit later, we all know about DNA forensics in, in humans. That is, you know, the DNA in us is, in us is kind of a barcode that can be used to identify individuals, you know, be used as a tool in, in ordinary criminal forensics. Uh, what most people don't consider is the fact that cotton is a natural product as well. It's got its own DNA in it, and even in a mature fiber and even shirt, there's enough residual DNA that you can identify, at least in part, the origin of the cotton based upon the DNA in it, much as a, a CSI crime scene person can identify the human DNA that might appear on blood spatter and, and others. So what we've been developing at Applied DNA is the ability to use the cotton DNA to tell its own forensic story, much like human DNA can tell a story as a tool in that kind of One thing that's interesting is that is the, the analogy is much more similar than you would think, and that is that there are certain numbers of markers that are built into the human DNA that can be used for this kind of identification. There are also very similar sorts of markers that are, that are embodied in the cotton DNA and that we have found uh, can also be used for similar sorts of things. In addition to that, we can do something that can't, that can't be done quite so readily with human forensics, and that is, in addition to taking advantage of the DNA that has been born into the cotton, so to speak, we can apply DNA, hence the pun in our name, to cotton at gins. And so as we speak in the U.S. ginning season, we, we, are, now, we, we are deploying at numerous gins in the U.S. folks and equipment that are actually DNA marking all of the cotton that is being produced in numerous gins. California and Arkansas and Texas to provide a second level of, of authentication. That is, not only be able to identify cotton based upon its endogenous DNA, but also based upon the, the DNA that we apply to it. Uh, what's important to recognize is the fact that this DNA persists in the cotton fiber throughout the entire supply chain. We can measure DNA in baled cotton out of your gin. We can do so in yarn. We can do it in woven material and even in finished What's important is the following. What we've already shown and have been doing for several years now is to show that the DNA markers that are in cotton, along with the DNA that we apply to it, that we sometimes call signature key, can be used to both identify the cotton and where it came from. The signature key can actually identify which gin the cotton came from uh, at the time it was tagged. What's interesting, though, is that you know, in a highly controlled environment with the good guys, so to speak, uh, when we are, where we are, where we are applying DNA at the gin, it's easy to track the fate of that throughout the markets. But when you can't do that in a place in places where they're not regulated and oppressive, like Uzbekistan, how can we get more information to help decision makers track what's happening? And I think what's important to realize is the following: and that is, for a long time, over the last 20 years, human DNA forensics have developed something called the CODIS database and tools which allow you to sequentially begin to identify progressively higher levels of certainty things about human DNA. At the highest level, an unknown DNA sample can be used to determine whether the sample is from a male or a female. At a lower, at a higher level, one can dig in and essentially impute ethnicity and in certain instances, a homeland associated with that ethnicity and at the very, very highest level, you can combine all of those, and if you have a large database, you can actually 
determine precisely the origin of the DNA that you're looking at in the human in particular. The cotton level is very similar. That is, at the highest level, the tools we have now can distinguish the highest value Pima from the lower value upland cottons. At the next level, we're working with the USDA to develop additional markers that can allow us to identify cultivars such as cottons grown perhaps in Uzbekistan, and that having coupled that to geographical information, identify unambiguously where the cotton came from. And so the idea being that as a result of all this, you can identify, let's say, based on the cotton that would be obtained from a finished garment, was it in fact owned in the, did the cotton only come from the U.S., for instance, or was it in fact uh, accidentally or intentionally blended with cottons from other areas such as Uzbekistan? And the reason this is so important, many of you may know this, is that the international cotton supply chain is very complicated. In the U.S., cotton is grown, a great deal of cotton is grown in the United States. It goes abroad, woven in places in places like Pakistan, and then spun in Pakistan can be woven in another place. The garments can be made in another area. And as a result of that, very quickly, it becomes, it becomes a blend, or it can become a blend, where it becomes almost impossible to track, for instance, where something such as Uzbeki cotton may actually reside, so that, hence the concern that uh, it can be dissipated into the supply chain very easily and hard to track. And so the idea is to try to develop tools that can do this. What we do, again, that's sort of the, the stick part of it is to develop tools that would allow us to uh, detect the presence of a cult material such as from Uzbekistan in finished goods. The more positive note is that we're working with, I guess, you know, very, you know, high, you know, with respect to, we're working with suppliers who are in fact the good guys in the sense that they allow us to come in, validate the cotton, apply DNA to it so as to tag it, so that we have multiple levels of uh, authentication available to us to attract within the supply chain. So this idea that we can, we can both assist those who are trying to do the right thing by means of these technologies and also try to find out those who perhaps aren't by applying the CODIS like Just to finish up, uh, we're a, a company, we're a, private, a publicly traded company in Long Island. We've been involved in the cotton supply chain for the last couple of years. As we speak, we have folks going out in the field. We'll be marking about 150 million pounds of U.S. cotton this year. We'll be marking with DNA. We've initiated a collaboration with the USDA to develop this CODIS-like panel of markers that will be used to identify uh, cottons as from Uzbekistan, and over the next two years we'll be working closely with the USDA and a number of others to develop this kind of international cotton database that could be used to essentially obtain something that we sometimes call geotyping, that is the ability to identify based on the cotton that's in a garment or, or bedding, for instance, where if it's a blend, and if it is a blend, where did, where did the various sorts of cotton actually originate in the supply chain? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike and Janice, coming all the way from New York, and thank you to all our panelists. We have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, we'll take a few and then let our panelists respond. Uh, anyone has a question in mind? Yes. Um, thank you very much to the panelists for presenting to us today. My name is Kendra Ivan. I'm a base candidate from Canada, studying at the Bedouin University. Um, so my question is, basically we've talked a lot today about the complicity of the World Bank in torturing Uzbekistan, uh, how they have a responsibility to uphold the court cogent norms. Um, but yet despite all this, you see more investments going on into Uzbekistan. And there's been a general urging from several panelists that these disbursements should be suspended. Uh, my question is, what effect would that actually have on the ground in Uzbekistan, and what other efforts could be done on the international level to help alleviate the situation? Can we take the second question from this gentleman? Hi, thanks for, for your speech. And I have a question with uh, Michael. 
token. And uh, my question is, uh, actually, I'm uh, actually I'm a, I'm a charge to the DNA science, so uh, maybe I'm wrong. So, so during the process of uh, making clothes, is the chemistry process won't harm the DNA? And also, I mean, for I mean, you, you put so much time, so much energy to to typing this thing to to identify this geolocation, but I would say is I would say it's much easier to just directly uh, influence the country know to know to do this know to know to use the forced labor. I would say it's much easier. address both, both aspects. First, uh, what's interesting is that although cotton, you know, going back to the, how is the DNA affected by textile processing, what's interesting is that the DNA on the inside, the DNA that was born into the cotton, so to speak, is actually on the inside of the fiber, not on the outside. And it's in tight association with the cellulose that it's made from. So it actually persists through the bleaching and other steps very, very well, actually. And so, in fact, this we can go into it later, but we, with the folks that we already work with, we, we monitor cotton at each step in the supply chain, and we can look at the amount of DNA available in its state, and it, it persists quite nicely through that. The second question is more sophisticated, and that is, why do it at all? And I think part of it has to do, is the bigger picture is that, by itself, DNA-based analysis can't solve these problems. But much like in human forensics, you can make the argument that DNA testing in crime scenes can't solve these problems by themselves either, but they've proven to be a very useful tool to help identify, give leads with respect to those who might be breaking the law, pointing attention in the right direction. So I agree with you, it's not, it's not an end all. It, it, I think it is, however, a useful set of tools, particularly in the cotton supply chain. In the cotton supply chain, one of the reasons, the question is, well, there's so much cotton grown in Uzbekistan, where does it all go? The answer is it becomes dissipated in an extremely complicated international supply chain. And it's very hard to track. And so people have taken advantage of the fact that once it goes maybe through the spinner, it's almost impossible to detect where this cotton may have gone. Tools that allow you to perhaps look a bit more deeply and see where the cotton may be, maybe in the shirt, even though it's not supposed to be, can help point can focus attention and allow other mechanisms to kick in, legal, societal, and so forth, to help solve these problems. It, it, it's, a, it's a really good question that we think about a lot ourselves. I think there, there are two elements to why we believe that the World Bank should suspend its agriculture projects. And just to be clear that we're, we're only suggesting that the agriculture projects should be suspended, even though other projects are implicated. Uh, we, additional measures need to be taken in those other projects as well. But for the agriculture projects where the links are so clear, it, first of all, one reason for it is that the, we don't believe that the World Bank and the other international financial institutions, particularly the Asian Development Bank, are using their leverage sufficiently in order to, uh, in order to con convince the government to dismantle its forced labour system. What we had said before this uh, significant uh, increase in, in agriculture projects went forward at the World Bank is hold off now until you see progress within Uzbekistan. And that progress needs to be about disman dismantling the forced labour system. It can't just be about a change in rhetoric, which we've seen from the Uzbek government. Yes, the government now is willing to talk about addressing forced and child labour in a way that it wasn't before. That doesn't change the lives of people on the ground who who Alison has spoken about here. So what we would like to see the World Bank do is suspend its agriculture projects and outline clearly what benchmarks the government needs to meet in order for those disbursements to start to flow again. And those benchmarks include things like, uh, like starting to dismantle the actual system, which, in, which requires removing the quotas uh, and, uh, and allowing independent monitoring and actually giving clear orders that all the way down the chain, that again, Alison put up here, that the, the government uh, 
it is no longer going to order anyone down that chain to mobilise, to forcibly mobilise, um, to mobilise people to work in the fields. Once those benchmarks are met, then at, or then at each point when some of those benchmarks are met, then disbursements can start to flow again. But the leverage is, is not being used in the way that we think it should be. Secondly, there's a principal element here. The, there should not be any forced and child labour on any World Bank project area anywhere in the world. This is our taxpayer money that's going to development. It isn't development if it's funding project areas in which there is child and forced labour. Uh, and for that reason uh, alone, the, the bank shouldn't be funding these kinds of projects. And sorry, you also mentioned what else, can, what else should happen around the world. Uh, so we, we are not only pushing the World Bank as the only international actor here, we're strongly engaged with the European Union, with the US government, uh, and the, things like the US government with their trafficking in persons report, recognising that the situation in Uzbekistan is so bad that it should be tier three. These kinds of uh, mechanisms, th these kinds of uh, sanctions need to be also put in place. I'd like to add a few points about as well. I think it's um, useful to look at the example of Burma um, and the ILO and the UN's engagement with Burma and how through this supervisory system and through sanctions um, that ultimately contributed to reforms of um, the forced labor system in that country. I think also it's important to consider that the World Bank is a specialized agency of the United Nations and with that it has certain obligations within the UN system that it should adhere to. I think that the, the UN could, could increase its role um, and speak out about some of the you know, alleged violations and some of the problems that we've discussed today um, since the World Bank is closely engaged with the UN in many different aspects. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question over here. one of the biggest cocoa supplier of country. So my question is like it has two aspects. The first is that like if we uh, put some sanctions, economic sanction on the country to compel the government to uh, comply with the poor labor standards, I mean, uh, will it not lead to some um, poverty? Like it will like lead to poverty because I mean, uh, like uh, in Pakistan, almost 50% of uh, the labor, they are dependent on the car cotton industry. Uh, and secondly, if uh, instead of uh, putting sanctions on the country or on the government to compel them to uh, comply with this core labor standard, what if we offer them some incentives like free trade or uh, some other um, incentives in an uh, international market to make the government to uh, raise the standard of the core labor standard? I mean, which one would be, I mean, more, uh, you say, which one would have more positive? Thank you. And one more question over here. Yes. My name is Rafiq Dabri from the International Cotton Advisory Committee here in uh, Washington, not far from here. Uh, I'm the cotton guy. We know what uh, the applied DNA is doing and what is the status and how far it is from practical application. I'm also familiar with the cotton production system in Uzbekistan. The second speaker mentioned, and uh, it's not different from many more countries uh, in the world. Uh, I don't have a question to any of the speakers, but I rather would like to make a comment and partly answer one of the questions from there, the lady from Canada, that what else can be done. Today, we are spending about 25 cents to take a kilogram of cotton, and it is only less than what we spend on fertilizer. Okay. Machine picking is much cheaper than hand picking. It is established. We have a data to show, and certainly everybody wants to pick cotton with machine because it costs less. In order to avoid any forced labor, gladly know that they did not notice any forced child labor since 2014, but in order to avoid any residual or whatever the remaining post-child labor is used, if it is used, you have to give them 
small machines. If it answered to these questions from, from the lady there, what would you do? Uzbekistan has done a lot and come to this stage that they could not find that there was no forced child labor in 2014. But to take it further, we need also to take more steps. One of them will be to encourage projects to develop small machines. And it is for sure that Uzbekistan has invested much more than any other country to develop small machines, handheld machines. So if we have the machines, the problem would be solved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comment. Please see if, we, if the panelists could respond to the first question. And we also have a comment here in Cognito. Something new. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'll begin, and, and I'm sure my colleagues have a lot to add. I, so there are, there are these very significant uh, labor concerns in your country as well, but it's a very different uh, situation to in Uzbekistan, where we have a, a government-controlled system of forced labor, which also results in, in child labor for the reasons that Alison shared. So in, in this case, it's very, very different. Uh, and the, the profits from cotton, farmers don't find cotton profitable within the country. Uh, the profits are benefiting a select few uh, senior government officials. So, uh, so for that reason, it, it's it's really it, we we need to ensure that we mitigate any kind of impacts on ordinary people. Uh, but it's not the same kind of situation as where if if there is real pressure on the government to end its cotton, it end its uh, forced labour system, that it's going to stop producing cotton and that it's going to have these other ill effects. There is. The voluntary labour within the cotton, the, the, the work in uh, the cotton system in Uzbekistan, and I think stepping aside a little bit from from my from my role, I think it's it is really important to make sure that those people continue to have have a job and continue to have a livelihood, and that uh, the push for mechanisation doesn't remove them from having an option to to work in this sector because. There, are, there is a, a great concern within the entire region of Central Asia with a, the lack of, of jobs at the, at the moment and previously as well, but particularly at the moment. So I think that, that very much needs to be considered. I think the incentives are already there. There are a great number of companies that are boycotting Uzbek cotton because of the use of, of forced labor and, and child labor to a lesser extent. So there is really, an, we, I don't think we need to do more to create that incentive. It's there. It's had some impact, but it's not. It's not enough. Uh, and the World Bank can do something, perhaps, to support that incentive. But it needs to ensure that when it's doing that, is that it isn't itself uh, allowing or, or funding uh, the the forced labour system. I might, well, I might say something from a technical perspective. We work an awful lot uh, with gins that collect enormous amounts of cotton. Going back to the comment that was made about, made about the, you know, begging the question, why would hand picking continue when in fact automation would be so much less expensive? The fact is it's absolutely obvious that the incoming cotton into a gin has been picked by machine or picked by hand. It appears in a completely different form. It's impossible to be confused. So let's say hypothetically that and also, a second thing to note, in the way in which cotton is generally produced in gins, gins tend to be localized and accept cotton from a regional area. So if one were to imagine that a region of Uzbekistan were to make the transition from hand picking to automated picking, A, it would be completely transparent that in fact what was now being introduced into the gin was coming from machines and not from children. And B, having done so, it would be easy to check that off. It could be, be very easy to over the course of the ginning season to have those who would be keeping an eye on the input, confirming that in fact what was coming into this particular gin was exclusively from automated, uh, automated collection. And at that point you could begin a process where in fact you could immediately dis distinguish cotton that was coming into a gin based upon automation versus cotton that was coming into a gin that was based by picking by hand. Even inside of Uzbekistan, we do this 
all the time, for instance, in the U.S., cotton that comes in that is coming from organic farms versus cotton that's coming into a gym from non-organic farms. In fact, if you have a way of identifying that, in fact, this is organic cotton, it can be tagged as such and then tracked that way thereafter. So I think that there's a real desire to implement automation to replace slavery in Uzbekistan, and in fact, that's a realistic financial opportunity it should be possible, gin by gin, region by region, to absolutely unambiguously identify that the transition is underway. And I think uh, that the technology of the day I know can handle that. Thank you very much, Mike. We're out of time. It's almost 5 o'clock, and we have time only for final remarks from our panelists. If Andy, Allison, Jessica, Mike, if, if there are any more, if any other remarks, then we'll conclude. Sure. Um, just a few points of reflection. Um, while I was drafting my report, you know, one of the issues that came up quite repeatedly um, is that where can, what forum can we look to to enforce the law? Right? I, I don't think that um, there's much dispute as to whether the World Bank is violating international law. I think the question is whether the World Bank can be held legally accountable for it. Right. There are many questions of immunity, for example, of international organizations in the U.S. Um, but I, I think that that shouldn't be the focus you know, of discussion. We should really be looking at you know, why would victims have to resort to lawsuits or why would NGOs have to resort to public campaigns against the World Bank or to ensure that victims' rights are respected and reparations are provided according to international law. I think it would be much more productive for the World Bank to consider how it could affirmatively promote and protect human rights and how it could integrate human rights into its policies and programs in order to better alleviate poverty and therefore fulfill its mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to end by saying that even though forced labor is a long-standing and deeply entrenched problem in Uzbekistan, the situation is not hopeless. Um, we've seen over the years that pressure works, and that pressure is the only thing that has worked to promote change in Uzbekistan. Um, the government has the ability to make changes, even sweeping changes, um, to end forced labor. We saw it in the vast, significant, and almost immediate reduction in child labor in 2012, 13, and 15. Um, so we need to use the tools and the leverage that we have, and I can use them really very, very broadly, um, from increasing DNA analysis to continuing independent monitoring to campaigning to the involvement of companies and investors, and certainly the leverage that the bank has um, to push the government to find the political will to, to make these changes. These are changes it can make. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, and just I'll, I'll add to what Alison was saying, that these are also changes that the, the World Bank can make. Yes, it's, it's highly invested now in the agriculture sector in, in Uzbekistan, but it, it can still take a, a, take a principled approach, as it has in some other countries around the world. We've seen it recently. It has taken, taken a staggered a, approach to, uh, to working to address women's rights and children's rights within its, its investments in Uganda. We need to see the same kind of commitment from the World Bank here in Uzbekistan. Thank you. With respect to technology, I, I think one of the things that we've learned is that technology can't provide political resolve, commercial resolve. If there is a <coughs> desire to make things change, what technology can do is provide transparency and the ability to quantify things. And I think that there is a, a, a desire to, to not necessarily change all of Uzbekistan at once, but region by region to undergo some transitions where automation would replace slavery. I think the technology of the day can help make it obvious that that's occurred, and the good cotton that would come to be from Uzbekistan could be tracked throughout the world as distinct from the rest of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, for your active participation, and have a good rest of your day.